Well, good afternoon. It is amazing to think that four years ago we began, and we were a very small group, and today there are so many here. We thank God for what he is doing and for bringing you here to our conference uh, today and tomorrow. To begin, I'd like you to think for a moment with me about your people, the people in your church. Think about the folks to whom you minister or who sit next to you or around you when the church comes together to pray or to worship God. Who are they? Who are these people in your mind? Well, I'm sure that some of them are families led by godly men, men who know Christ and who demonstrate their love for the Lord Jesus. And there are women who love their husbands, who submit to them and serve them, and encourage one another. And there are children who encourage you because they show the signs of grace at work in their lives. Some of you have seniors, men and women who have spent many years on earth and who look forward to meeting their Savior soon. Some of you have single mothers who are struggling to face all of the challenges that come into the lives of single parents. Perhaps You're thinking about some men who profess faith, but they actually discourage you because they never seem to make progress in the Christian life. Or you're thinking about teenagers who only attend church because their parents bring them to church week by week. Or maybe you remember the children, the little boys and girls, who every week look forward to the hug that they get from their pastor and they smile every time they see you. Those are the people that God has given to you, the people that you serve. Now let me ask you this question about them. What do you desire most for them? What is the thing that you wish most for their benefit? Well, I suspect that it is exactly what our Lord Jesus expresses in his high priestly prayer in John 17, 3. Remember the words that he spoke? He said, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That's what our Lord Jesus said, that's what he spoke, that's what he prayed for. And I suspect that that is your desire as well. For all of those people, for the ones who encourage you the most and the ones who discourage you the most, Your desire for them is a genuine knowledge of the one true living God. Now it's interesting, isn't it, that Jesus phrases himself in this way. Because he doesn't simply speak of God in a generic sense, but actually who he is, the only true living God, as he is opposed to all idols and all pretenders to the title of God. Jesus prays to God the Father, asking him to make himself truly known to all of his people. And that's Jesus' prayer, and that's your prayer as well. But these people that you have in mind, all of these different folks, let me ask you what may be a surprising question. Do they really know the only true God? Do they really know the only true God? The God who reveals himself in Scripture, God who is described in that famous question from the Shorter Catechism, what is God? God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Do they know him? See, I think that maybe we shouldn't assume that our people think clearly about God. Because they live in a world in which they are bombarded by cultural misconceptions about God. It's inescapable for them to be confronted by misconceptions about God. God is a higher power, and as a higher power, he exists to make you happy. Maybe you're familiar with the phrase that has become very popular and very helpful to describe the religious climate of the day in which we live. It's been described as moralistic, therapeutic deism. That's a really good description 
of the religious climate in the Western world today. How many times have you seen, and how many times have your people seen, the coexist bumper sticker on the back of cars, right? With all the different religious symbols to spell out the word coexist. And they will be thinking about the intention of that word. All paths lead to this God because he's only a squishy kind of love, right? That's what our people confront. Or they might have misconceptions about God that come from their families or the nurture in their lives. Children, for example, who are raised with a stern father, when they hear that God is a father, will tend to think of God in the same terms that they think of their own father. You see, there are potentially many misconceptions, many possible influences that may lead your people astray in their thoughts of God. Now, let me drive a little bit closer to home. What about you? Do you clearly know God as he has revealed himself in Scripture? Okay, now that you've answered that question for yourself, the next one is, are you sure? I want to give you a quiz. Five true and false questions. Okay? Just keep track of these mentally. The answer to each one is either true or false. Listen closely, and you can grade yourself after we're done. I'll go over these questions and tell you what the right answer is. Okay? Here we go. Number one, statement number one. The sovereign God exercises sovereign control over himself. True or false? The sovereign God exercises sovereign control over himself. Okay? First question, or first statement. Second one. The doctrine of God's aseity teaches us that God has his being from himself. Okay? The doctrine of God's aseity teaches us that God has his being from himself. Third statement, third quiz statement for you. Since man is made in the image of God, we may say that in certain ways, God's being is like man's being. Okay? Since man is made in the image of God, we may say that in certain ways, God's being is like man's being. True or false? How are you doing so far? Question or statement number four. Christian monotheism teaches that God progressively reveals himself first as Father, then as Son, and finally as Holy Spirit. Okay, I'll repeat that. That's a little bit longer. Christian monotheism teaches that God progressively reveals himself first as Father, then as Son, and finally as Holy Spirit. That's statement number four. And then statement number five, the last one of these. The incarnation binds the eternal God to the timeline of his people. Okay? The incarnation binds the eternal God to the timeline of his people. Now, did you keep score for yourself? You have how many trues and how many falses you have in your mind, okay? Here are the answers. Number one, the sovereign God exercises sovereign control over himself. False. Number two, the doctrine of God's aseity teaches us that God has his being from himself. False. Number three, since man is made in the image of God, we may say that in certain ways God's being is like man's being. False. Number four, <clears throat> Christian monotheism teaches that God progressively reveals himself first as Father, then as Son, and finally as Holy Spirit. False. And the last one, did I change it up? The incarnation binds the eternal God to the timeline of his people. False. 
all of those statements are false. If you said true, Houston, we have a problem. <clears throat> I ask you, how well did you do? Please don't speak. <laughs> now, one or two of these are obviously false. Number four was clearly modalism. And I hope everybody recognized. And I threw it in there just so that you'd say, well, that one has to be false. Maybe somebody, something else is true. Okay. The others were phrased to seem plausible, but, they, but as they are expressed, they are false. Now, what is my purpose in this exercise? Well, my purpose is to demonstrate to you that the doctrine of God involves difficult concepts which must be expressed extremely carefully. And we as gospel ministers must know these things, and we must think through them carefully. Let me put it this way. If there is a mist surrounding the doctrine of God in your mind, then you may be sure that there's a deep, dark fog in the minds of your people. See, if you don't have it clear and proper, you can be sure that the people who sit before you when you preach to them have a fog over the doctrine of God. You can be certain of that fact. Theology proper, the doctrine of God, is not a simple topic about which we may say, got it, next. But this is often how most people approach the matter. They say, yeah, I believe in God. He's great. He's majestic. He's a trinity. He saved me. It's really simple. But we should say, or not. You see, or not. It's much more complex. In Romans chapter 1, Paul teaches us that failure to recognize the truth about God is at the very root of the downward spiral of ungodly paganism. You, you all know Romans chapter 1. You remember what Paul says. The truth of the living God, they twisted. They suppressed it. And God gave them over to unrighteousness. And you know how that downward spiral works. A failure to know God, and that's knowing God in general revelation, produces terrible consequences. And that's, as I said, that's only based upon general revelation, never mind thinking about God in terms of special revelation. In Hebrews chapter 6, we are told that faith in God, the God who saves sinners, the God who keeps his promises, is one of the foundational principles or elementary doctrines of the Christian faith. You remember how the writer to the Hebrews mentioned six things, and he says, well, we're not going to lay down the fundamentals, the foundation anymore. Let's move on to maturity. And he considers this as a matter that belongs to the beginning. It's a starting point, the inception of the progress toward maturity. Something similar is said in Hebrews 11.6, where the writer says, Whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists. Not just a higher power, not just a super being, but there in Hebrews 11, the creator of heaven and earth, who is Father, Son, and Spirit. You see, we have to think in these terms. We must come to the doctrine of God recognizing how important it is, how foundational it is for our lives. Now, there's a caution that we have to remind ourselves of right here. It's the caution that I try to remind my students about when we work our way through the Baptist Confession of Faith and we come to chapter 2, and it goes something like this. Chapter 2 of the Confession of God and of the Holy Trinity is a wonderful statement about the being of God himself. It really is. But when we come to that chapter, when we come to think about theology proper, we must remind ourselves that we cannot think of God as a laboratory specimen. We cannot take him, even while we are working with our theology, and think that somehow we can place him on a table in front of us, dissect him, study him carefully, and then think that we know all that there is to know about God. On the other hand, 
What we must do when we approach the doctrine of God is come with a level of humility that perhaps we've never known before and say that our task is to receive that which he has revealed about himself in Scripture, knowing that ultimately we will not be able to comprehend it fully. We'll know it in the way that children know something of what is happening in their parents' lives, but even that's a poor illustration of the reality of what it means to come to know God. But isn't it too easy for us to place God on the table and dissect him and make him into a specimen and think that somehow we are above him, that we can describe him, that we can take him apart and we can know him in this way that you might be able to know the frog that's on the table in front of you in the biology lab? We have to be very careful that we don't fall prey to such a thing. Rather, we receive what he is pleased to reveal about himself. Now, I'd like you to take your Trinity hymnal, if you would, please, and turn in the back of the hymnal to page 671. Not hymn number 671, but page 671. And uh, towards the bottom of that page, we find the text of chapter 2 of our confession of God and of the Holy Trinity. Now, I think that Dr. Dolzell will be spending a lot of time here, and I don't want to steal his thunder. And so I won't take the opportunity right now to read chapter 2 in its entirety, but I would like you to notice the third paragraph with me. And notice something very interesting about this. Um, the Baptists, when they edited the Westminster Confession and the Savoy Declaration and produced the Second London Confession in 1677, did a very careful editing job on those previous documents. They're very fine documents, Westminster and Savoy. But I think that the Baptists made some significant improvements. And especially, we, we notice this in paragraph 3. Follow along with me as I read it. And you, from here on out, you'll want to keep your hymnal open, because I, I'm going to make reference to a lot of places in the confession from here on out. But notice paragraph 3 with me, OK? In this divine and infinite being, that is, the one who is described in the first two paragraphs, in this divine and infinite being, there are three subsistences, the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, of one substance, power, and eternity, each having the whole divine essence, yet the essence undivided. The Father is of none, neither begotten nor proceeding. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father. The Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son, all infinite, without beginning, therefore but one God, who is not to be divided in nature and being, but distinguished by several peculiar relative properties and personal relations. And then, which doctrine of the Trinity is the foundation of all our communion with God and comfortable dependence on him? The doctrine of the Trinity is the foundation of all of our comfortable, of all of our communion with God and comfortable dependence on Him. Now I hope that you recognize that paragraph three describes in classical terms, using ancient terminology, the very difficult doctrine of the Trinity. It is based on the assertions that we find in the first two paragraphs, speaking of the three subsistences or persons in terms of their divine unity and their relative properties and personal relations. Brothers and sisters, this is one of the deepest points of theology. This is one of the most difficult and challenging aspects of theology, the doctrine of the Trinity as it is expressed here, and it is expressed in the terms of classical Christian theism. And this difficult doctrine, which is so challenging, which has taken centuries to define and to begin to understand, this doctrine, this profound material that we encounter, 
we are told, is the foundation of our communion with God, of knowing God, of loving and being loved by God the Father. It is the foundation. My students know that one of the reference books that I urge them to use when, we, when they work their way through the Confession of Faith is the Oxford English Dictionary, which is a wonderful resource that locates the use of words throughout the history of the English language. If you look up the word foundation in the Oxford English Dictionary, this is what you would read. A basis or groundwork on which something immaterial is raised or by which it is supported or confirmed an underlying ground or principle. That's what is intended by this word um, foundation here. It's at the bottom, it's at the root, and everything stands upon it. Not literally, metaphorically, but everything stands upon this doctrine of the Trinity. This is the foundation of our communion with God, of loving him, of knowing his love. This is the foundation. And of our comfortable dependence upon him. Now, I like to be comfortably dependent on God, don't you? I'm sure that you do. OED, Oxford English Dictionary, the first sense that it gives to the word comfortable as an adjective in its active sense is this. Strengthening or supporting morally or spiritually, encouraging, inspiriting, reassuring, cheering. The foundation of our comfortable dependence upon God. The most difficult of Christian doctrines is the basis, the root, the foundation of our communion with him and our comfortable dependence upon him. You know what? That's the language of Hebrews 6 which speaks about the foundation principles. The, second, the first one, repentance from dead works. The second one, faith in God. Or Hebrews 11.6, which says, those who come to him must believe that he is. This is absolutely necessary. This is the positive alternative to Romans chapter 1, where the one true living God is rejected. If we know the one true living God, we won't be in a downward spiral of immorality but rather we will be strengthened to live our lives to the glory of God. That communion with him will be encouraged. And this is the very thing that our Lord Jesus prayed for in his high priestly prayer recorded for us in John 17 and verse 3. The foundation of our communion and comfortable dependence upon God. Listen to William Ames. William Ames was very important in the background of our confession of faith. In his Marrow of Divinity, where he speaks about the doctrine of God, he says things like this. We conceive God to be before we can conceive him to be just and good. Or, our faith hath a firm foundation because it leaneth on God, the possessor and author of all perfection, blessedness, and glory. I think that exactly encapsulates what the end of chapter 2 is about. And then one more quote from Ames. Faith is a resting of the heart on God as on the author of life and eternal salvation. That's what it's all about. Now, some of my time was stolen from me early on in this hour. You might have noticed that. But I'll do my best to follow the exhortation to stay within time. I want you to think about this doctrine with me in terms of the confession as a whole. You know, it's a mistake to read the confession as 32 discrete theological topics, as if they're unrelated to each other. Actually, they're intimately related and built together. And the doctrine of God is presented to us not just in three paragraphs in chapter 2, but it is the foundation of everything else that's written in the confession. And I won't have time to say everything that I would like to say. But let me show you how this works in some places in the Confession of Faith. Um, just turn back one page with me to the first paragraph, uh, the first chapter and the first paragraph. Speaking about the Holy Scriptures, the, the principle of knowing. The, the doctrine of God is the principle of being. The Scriptures are the principle of knowing. 
Notice what the first few lines of the confession say. The Holy Scripture is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. That's a statement about the necessity of special revelation in order that we might savingly know, savingly believe, savingly obey God. Okay? The Scripture is necessary. That's an addition that was made by the Baptists. You won't find that in the Westminster Confession. You won't find that in Savoy. They actually begin with the word although. Now let's look at that. Although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God as to leave men inexcusable, Yet are they not sufficient to give that knowledge of God and his will which is necessary unto salvation? Therefore it pleased the Lord at sundry times and in diverse manners to reveal himself and to declare that his will unto his church and afterward for the better preserving and propagating of the truth to inscripturate it. God's goodness is revealed in general revelation. You see, Everything about the world around us does tell us that God exists, and it tells us that he's a good God. Paul says that in Romans chapter 14, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 14, when he's in Lystra. That's clear and plain. But God may only be truly known in terms of special revelation. Scripture is necessary. A knowledge of God that is based in general revelation cannot say, and yet this God who is described for us in such beautiful terms in chapter 2 is the God who has determined that he will make himself known graciously by inspiring for us this book that we hold in our hands. It is the true words of the living God, you see. And, and that's, a, that's a, the greatest blessing that we could possibly receive. This great God has given to us his holy word. If we... I, I want to skip, but paragraph 4 speaks about the authority of Holy Scripture and bases that authority in the person of God. It is what it is, because God is the one who is behind it. Yes, there were many human authors, but those human authors were carried along by the Holy Spirit and were guided to write what they have given to us. And so we receive it not as the words of men, but as the words of God. We have to go quickly. Skipping over chapter 2, notice paragraph 3. I'm sorry, chapter 3. The first thing that we notice, the first doctrine that we encounter after this wonderful statement about the doctrine of the Trinity, referring back to the whole doctrine of God as the foundation of all of our communion with God and comfortable dependence on Him, the first thing that we encounter is, a, is the doctrine of His sovereignty, of His decree. And we are told in paragraph 7, well, read it with me. The doctrine of this high mystery of predestination is to be handled with special prudence and care, that men attending the will of God revealed in his word and yet yielding obedience thereunto may from the certainty of their effectual vocation be assured of their eternal election. Now that, if you're one of my students, you know that that's a pointer all the way to chapter 18 on assurance. But also so shall the doctrine afford matter of praise, reverence, and admiration of God, and of humility, diligence, and abundant consolation to all that sincerely obey the gospel. Abundant consolation because God has a decree, and God has a decree because of God is who he is. You see how it all works back. You have to go back. You have to think back. This is what it is because God is as glorious as he is. Chapter 4 of Creation, paragraph 1. In the beginning, it pleased God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity, for the manifestation of the glory of his eternal power, wisdom, and goodness, language that turns us right back to, to chapter 2, and notice especially the emphasis on his goodness. It is this God, this triune God, who creates or makes the world and all things therein, whether visible or invisible, in the space of six days, and all very good. This heads off any kind of dualism, that there's evil in the material world. It is what it is because God made it to be 
what it is. He's the creator of heaven and earth. We, we have to run through this oh so quickly. Chapter 5 of divine providence. You know, the Baptists did something really interesting here because they changed the language of the Westminster Confession. In, in paragraph 1, the Westminster Confession, which is completely orthodox and very good, says, God the great creator, etc. But our fathers changed this to God the good creator. And the paragraph ends, almost the next to the last word, the, the third from the last, is the word goodness. The, the idea of God's goodness, of God being a good God, acts like brackets on the doctrine of providence. And it speaks, the doctrine of providence speaks to his continuing activity in the world. This great and glorious God is imminent. And he is here. And he acts, and he rules, and he governs, he sustains, he supports. And the doctrine of providence which is intended to remind us of his goodness, is grounded in that doctrine of the person of God. Chapter, uh, paragraph 5. The most wise, righteous, and gracious God doth oftentimes leave for a season his own children to manifold temptations and the corruptions of their own hearts, to chastise them for their former sins, or to discover unto them the hidden strength of corruption and deceitfulness of their hearts, that they may be humbled and to raise them to a more close and constant dependence for their support upon himself, and to make them more watchful against all future occasions of sin and for other holy and just ends. Why is it that Christians will go through the valley of the shadow of death? Or they will encounter temptations and even fall prey to those temptations? Well, it's because of the goodness of God in providence, because he wants to call them and use those things to bring them closer to himself. Paragraph 7. The pro as the providence of God doth in general reach to all creatures, so after a most special manner it taketh care of his church, and disposeth of all things to the good thereof. In the last six months of this year, given the political climate that we have seen develop in the United States of America, how many times have you or the people in your church had fear across your minds because of what we see developing. And yet the confession of faith brings us back to God and his providence, reminding us that he takes special care for his church. You see, we're brought back to the great God again. Now we, we could continue. Chapter 7 deals with uh, God's covenant. It speaks about the creator-creature distinction. Chapter 8, which speaks to us of Christ the mediator, begins with these wonderful words, it pleased God in his eternal purpose to choose and ordain the Lord Jesus, his only begotten Son, according to the covenant made between them both, etc. There is a Trinitarian sending of our Lord Jesus Christ in order to accomplish our salvation. Paragraph 2 of chapter 8 is a wonderful statement of Christ the God-man, the theanthropic union where the second person of the Trinity takes upon himself humanity and forever is one person with two natures, a fully divine nature and a fully human nature, as our Savior. He is God in everything that it means to be God. That can be said about our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we could spend all of our time here, but we're reminded of the doctrine of God. Time's running away from me. In chapter 9, of free will. Notice the first word in chapter 9. It's, the chapter talks about man, but it begins with God. Whatever it says about man is based upon God and what God has determined for man. In chapter 10, of effectual calling, it's divine grace that calls the elect. Is that practical? Why are you here today? You personally, privately. Why are you here? Because at some point, at the right moment, God, by his word and spirit, called you out of the death of your sins and gave you life in Jesus Christ. God did that. That's why it's not the Arminian, Southern California Arminian Baptist Pastors Conference, you see. <coughs> Chapter 11 of Justification. This God who calls 
the elect and gives them grace justifies them. Paul asks the rhetorical question in Romans 8.33, who shall bring a charge against us? Remember the answer? It is God who justifies. What higher court is there in the universe besides God? And God is the one, based on the imputation of the righteousness of his Son, who declares us to be justified. God does this. Chapter 12, adoption. What God does to call us into his family. We have that technical word, vouchsafe, which means to grant or to give by favor. God does this. And he makes us his own children. I wish that we had time to look at uh, the chapter on perseverance of the saints, chapter 17. We, we read about the, the sensible sight of the love of God, that he is still the same. Here, the doctrine of divine impassibility is presented to us as a great consolation for the believer. God, we perceive that God leaves us, but God never does leave us because he is always the same. And we can take great consolation in this fact. It's in chapter 18, on assurance, the work of God is always completed, even when we don't sense his love. The point of the, the chapter is that we change, but God does not change, and that's the bedrock of our assurance. Whether I feel that God loves me or not, God loves me, you see. And I can be assured of that and take great comfort of it. We come to chapter 21, one of the great statements that we ought to memorize. Paragraph 2, God alone is Lord of the conscience and hath left it free from the doctrines and commandments of men which are in anything contrary to his word or not contained in it. God alone. Chapter 22 tells us about worship. God is to be worshipped on the basis of general revelation, but the only way that we may know how to worship God properly is special revelation. Notice what it says. The light of nature shows that there is a God who hath lordship and sovereignty over all, is just good and doth good unto all, and therefore is to be feared, loved, praised, called upon, trusted in, and served with all the heart and all the soul and all the might. That's general revelation. But the acceptable way of worshiping the true God is instituted by himself, and so limited by his own revealed will that he may not be worshiped according to the imaginations and devices of men nor the suggestions of Satan under any visible representations or any other way not prescribed in the Holy Scripture. We have special revelation to tell us how this God is to be worshipped. If we were, my time is just about up. Chapter 24, the civil magistrate. Notice where it begins. God, the supreme Lord and King of all the world. Whatever it says about human government, it says in light of the doctrine of God. And if we go all the way to the end of the confession, the eschatology of the confession, we read things like this. The last paragraph. As Christ would have us to be certainly persuaded that there shall be a day of judgment, both to deter all men from sin and for the greater consolation of the godly in their adversity, so will he have that day unknown to men, that they may shake off all carnal security and be always watchful because they know not at what hour the Lord will come and may ever be prepared to say, come Lord Jesus, come quickly. This doctrine of his return that God will send him is for our comfort and for our preparation. Now that is a totally inadequate and the most rapid of surveys through the confession of faith. But I hope that you see the point. That which we believe about God is the basis for our growing and maturing discipleship. Have you ever considered the possibility that some of the problems your people face, whatever those problems might be, have you ever considered the possibility that they are rooted in feeble or faulty thoughts of God? And that the remedy to their problem is not three or four or five steps, but rather it's to bring them back to God and instruct them in who God is and help them to get hold of who God is 
and in doing that, their problem will be relieved. I think that's what the New Testament says, what the Old Testament says as well. I think that that's what the Confession says. I think that that's what Reformed theology says. Go back to God and think about God. That, the place to begin in helping our people to overcome the very real ch challenges of life is here. It's in theology, you see. And it's our task to teach that to them. Now, is the doctrine of God challenging? Well, of course it is. Just today, I was, I was reading uh, a post that someone made from Cyril of Alexandria who said this. The properties of the divine nature are difficult to utter and even more difficult to explain clearly. Brother, I hope that encourages you. <laughs> the properties of the divine nature are difficult to utter and even more difficult to explain clearly. You know what that means? That means that we stumble to express the ineffable, we stammer as we consider the incomprehensible, but this is what our people need, and it is what we need. And so, brothers and sisters, may I give you this exhortation. Put on your thinking caps. The material that you will hear tonight and tomorrow is of tremendous importance for the good of your people. It is the foundation of their communion with God and comfortable dependence upon him. Be prepared here to do the hard work of learning, of thinking, and knowing. Don't let laziness rob you and rob your people of the greatest blessing of all, which is to know the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. Well, may God be glorified in what we say and do in the next 36 hours, more or less. Brother, we pray that God will bless you and help you, and we look forward to the things that you will teach us. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, thank you. Thank you. And help us and help our brother and glorify yourself here in this place, and in every church that is represented, we ask in Jesus' name, amen.